when you stay in Bitcoin too long, uh, you will, uh, you have a very high probability to become mad. Giacomo, hello. Hello. Nice to have you. Nice to be here. So what we're drinking today? So, well, some coffee to compensate the effect of the alcohol, and uh, as an alcoholic beverage, limoncello, which is usually the final, uh, the, the final hit of uh, an Italian uh, abundant lunch. So usually when you eat a lot in Italy, the, um, the owner of the place will give you after the coffee some limoncello. It's a lemon-based liquor, a uh, lot of sugar, so it works pretty fast in getting you drunk, but we don't, I mean, uh, I I had my nights of being drunk on limoncello, but usually you don't. Just, <laughs> you just sit one drink. Okay, that's good. So limoncello is your favorite drink, as far as I understand. Um, except for wine, uh, for I mean, if we need uh, to get drunk fast, limoncello is my favorite choice for sure. Okay, cool. Um, so I had a pretty general question to start with, actually. Um, Many people who are involved in crypto, in particular in Bitcoin, they, they know you. You're famous on Twitter, famous uh, speaker, you speak a lot, you travel a lot, everyone knows you. But um, actually nobody knows what you're doing for a living. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a very singular situation, actually. So what I do for a living changed a little bit in the last years. When I, was, uh, when I first met Bitcoin in 2012, I was working for a multinational as a technology consultant. So I was basically a system designer and uh, also involved with the legacy payment, uh, pay payment industry. And uh, after one year of, uh, uh, of reading about Bitcoin, I decided to leave my job and to become a Bitcoin entrepreneur uh, and not, not alone, but I joined a four of different other entrepreneurs. So since, uh, since 2013 to 2015, I have been basically one of the guys in several different startups. Most of them are, uh, most of them failed badly, obviously, mm -hmm. but some of them survived, uh, namely like I uh, was working briefly for a green wallet, green address yeah. back then, and now it's a wallet of so uh, that, that, that was an happy ending. And uh, also I started a company about uh, blockchain for food traceability, that kind <laughs> of uh, utter bullshit, but back then it seemed like a good idea. Uh, and that was also an happy ending because after a while I realized that there was nothing uh, relevant that we could do with the blockchain and with the, with the food tracking. So uh, already in 2016, we uh, I asked the, the partners to pivot completely to normal tracking without the blockchain. <laughs> and so the company is doing well because of that. Do you think the Satoshi white paper was written uh, with the libertarian views in mind? Well, the white paper is, is really technical. So the, the, the thing about the white paper is, is that many, thing, many people think that white pa the white paper was the beginning. Uh, it was the beginning of the revelation, if you want, but it was not the beginning of the, the quest for Bitcoin, which started years before, and not even the beginning of the work of Satoshi, because when the white paper was written, most of the code was already ready. So Satoshi started to code, started to implement, and then he used the white paper as some kind of official way of communicating some of the most innovative characteristics, namely the, the blockchain proof of publication part, which was the most exotic. Other parts he didn't even include in the white paper. The white paper is very incomplete. Like you don't have the the total limit, uh, the, you, you don't have the total supply limit. Uh, a lot of things are missing from the white paper. So the white paper is very technical because that was his uh, idea. But if you go to, for example, the Nakamoto Institute website and you start to read the uh, uh, quotes and quotes from Satoshi, you see that uh, the operation Satoshi Nakamoto itself was highly political. He said, he, he basically, he was um, uh, self-mocking uh, about not being good at words and at, at politics, but he, he was kind of good at words as well. Like, yeah, he said, I'm better with at code than at words. Uh, but coding Bitcoin is, is fine, but it's not uh, the, the, the most important part. The most important part is the political design, and it was clearly a political action. So, yeah, the, the Satoshi operation, whoever was behind that, that pseudonym, was uh, highly political, in my opinion. So, Bitcoin is about politics and economics, or it's about code? Well, or it's both? 
It's both because gold was actually so gold. So money is a technology, a social technology, but is a social technology that is a, is a useful to help people to cooperate, which has political consequences. And in order to work properly, it needs two things that are very political. It needs basically what we could call the hardness. So the, the cost, the high cost to uh, replicate, to inflate the supply, uh, which is something that will basically um, nullify the, the new mantra of the monetary policy. So right now, nation states and conglomerates of states like the European Union, they live on the assumption that they can manipulate the money supply as they want in order to change interest rates, in order to uh, push investments, uh, cover um, crisis, uh, bail out banks, bail out friends. Uh, so basically they can control the market, controlling the most important market, which is money. And with, with a hard form of money, for example, gold in most of the human history, or Bitcoin, hopefully in the future, you cannot manipulate the supply anymore. So hard money is something with huge political implications on, on everything. And then the second component of Bitcoin and of good money in general is the darkness. So dark money is that kind of money which you don't need identity in order to exchange. So the group of people exchanging goods and services can grow uh, beyond your clan, your family, your trust circle, because you don't need anymore to know that the counterparty is nice or good or friendly or, share, or shares your opinions. You don't care because money is, uh, uh, is beyond identity and is something which doesn't come charged with an identity problem, which would actually destroy money because if you think about that, the moment that uh, when you get paid, you don't just have to check the money is real, but you have to check that everybody holding that money before was not maybe a journalist like Julian Assange because being a journalist is a crime, or it was not maybe a woman in Afghanistan because being a woman in Afghanistan doing business is a crime. So the, the point is that, you know, one interesting thing is when we discuss Bitcoin is that somebody says that Bitcoin is for criminals, and that's completely true because uh, everything we do, basically everything we are doing today is a crime in some jurisdiction of the world. And, uh, and like drinking limoncello is a crime, uh, like uh, driving uh, is, or uh, yeah, let's, let's do, let's, let, let, let's be criminal for a while. So this is a crime. Uh, basically everything I do every day is a crime somewhere. And if it's not, it was a crime at a certain point in time. Uh, if you are an atheist, that was punish punishable with that. If you are a Christian, that is punishable with that in some countries. If uh, everything you do is a crime somewhere. And so money is, uh, is uh, valuable if uh, it doesn't come with uh, attached to it a heavy history of uh, identity and, and political opinion and jurisdiction and laws. So uh, gold is that because if you receive a, a gold coin, you really, maybe you care about the face on top of it uh, just as a facilitation to verification of the amount. But actually you don't because you can melt it and you can coin a new coin. So when you receive a gold coin, you don't care who, which are the people holding it before. It's just uh, a value which is detached from identity. And Bitcoin, even if it still has some limitation in that regard, because it's not as private as gold yet, but a lot of, or a lot of smart people are working on that, Bitcoin is dark money in that sense. Cheers to that. Can you explain in, in simple words for general public, what is Bitcoin? What is Bitcoin for you and what is Bitcoin in general? Yeah, I cannot, I mean, I, I'm, sometimes I'm good at explaining, but I'm not good at explaining a few words. So I will make an effort. The point that uh, makes so difficult for me to use few words is that the word Bitcoin is abused for many, many things. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, ambiguity in the term, so it's better if we explain exactly all the specific meanings of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is several things. First of all, Bitcoin is an idea. It's an idea by Satoshi Nakamoto to use technology to build, as we say, the hard money, money that cannot be easily manipulated by a central bank, money that has a cost of production, so you, it cannot be easily inflated, and dark money, which, as we say, is money which is cash. 
cash means that is not connected to some kind of third party identity process when you when you want to uh, I don't know in the movie there is the the character of the movie running in Mexico with a bag of cash the point of cash is not to buy coffee with a with a cheap uh, fee the point of cash is to have to, to preserve privacy so digital cash uh, that uh, can basically be hard to forge and hard to produce and uh, and dark uh, this is the original idea and then there is the actual um, there is the actual uh, software implementing that idea. So Bitcoin is also a computer program. Now uh, the the main one is called Bitcoin Core in order to distinguish it from Bitcoin as a concept. So there is Bitcoin as a concept and there is Bitcoin as a software. Uh, like I mean like your word processor or your uh, uh, or your whatever whatever other software. So Bitcoin is a software with a set of rules like BitTorrent or, or Tor browsers and um, there are actually it, it is also a protocol, so a set of rules that many different programs, computer programs, can share in order to communicate uh, among themselves. So it's correct to say that Bitcoin Core is just one of possible implementation of the Bitcoin protocol. What is a little bit strange is that the Bitcoin protocol is not written anywhere. Uh, Bitcoin protocol, I mean, in, in computer science, sometimes, you define the protocol and then you write the software implementing the protocol. In Bitcoin, Satoshi created the software directly. So it's, it's a little bit more confused. It's a blur line. Then there is the network running that protocol, uh, which is an actual, I mean, um, you can copy the, the software because it's open source. So you can take the Bitcoin software, you change a few parameters and you copy it, but you cannot change the actual Bitcoin network running in consensus with that software. So uh, in order to, to stay on the Bitcoin network, you have to follow the Bitcoin rules and you cannot create uh, uh, infinite clones, which is interesting because as, when software is concerned, you can create infinite variants of Bitcoin. But when you think about the network, there is just one Bitcoin network, which is the one following the Bitcoin rules. And then there is the asset, the Bitcoin unit, which is an arbitrary division of the unit of value, which is also called Bitcoin. Usually we call the Bitcoin with a, with, a, with a small b, the asset, and with a, with, a, with a capital B, the protocol and the network and the idea. Uh, the good thing about this ambiguity is that uh, some scam coins don't have this ambiguity. For example, in Ethereum, you have Ethereum is the protocol and the network, and Ether is a scam coin. While in Bitcoin, you have the same name for both. But that's going to be solved, I think, uh, eventually, because uh, the unit that Satoshi Nakamoto decided to use as a, um, as let's say, as a theoretical unit, uh, the Bitcoin, uh, is so scarce that uh, if it succeeds, there is no other option that using like 0.0000000 bitcoins in normal trades. So people, for example, already Lightning Network, people is, is, uh, is using Satoshi, which is uh, the name of the creator, but also the, the, the 100 millionth part of a bitcoin. So uh, uh, eight zeros, one bitcoin is a Satoshi or a set, uh, like uh, pay me one set. And that's probably what uh, we will end up using if uh, Bitcoin succeeds. So Bitcoin is mostly a, a great idea and its implementation and the name of the unit of digital gold coming from that implementation. Okay. So um, last time we met, uh, I think it was in Munich, uh, you were constantly saying that Bitcoin is an experiment. Um, at which point you will consider that uh, it's no longer experiment? That's a very good question. I'm not sure there is a specific uh, metric where uh, is switched from experiment to, let's say, production ready. Uh, some uh, one could say that everything is an experiment, even even if it works for decades, it's still an experiment. I mean, central banking is working since more than a century, and it, it, it is a very bad experiment. It's going to fail eventually, but it's still running, so it's also a reality. Uh, and when people start to discuss macroeconomic effects of Bitcoin at a large scale. That's or maybe Bitcoin as an instrument to nullify trade restrictions. So uh, the president of the United States and the president of China, they fight. They decide to put uh, strange uh, uh, obstacles to payment or Russia or whatever. And, uh, and they have to say basically, OK, we want to, to stop payments from this country to this country. 
but there is Bitcoin, and that's a problem. We have to discuss how to stop Bitcoin. Uh, I think that at least one nation state ban would be a good thing. Uh, I mean, it's a bad thing, but it means that they, they I mean, it means that it's India. working. Yeah, India. yeah. Will there be banks in the end? So uh, banks will exist, in my opinion, in a Bitcoin world, but they will be less relevant. They would be like uh, um, probably uh, the, the level of banking uh, we've seen right now is hypertrophic and is, it is created by government intervention and manipulation. So I suspect, we, we cannot know, but I suspect that a, a, a natural uh, banking system will be smaller and it will not be focused on uh, political jobs like uh, uh, spying on people, uh, move, uh, um, uh, financial movements or creating money out of thin air, but they will, con they will probably focus on storing wealth for the clients and matching credit uh, demand and offer. About the KYC, um, do you think that actually KYC is needed to, to reach the mass adoption or the masses should understand that they don't need KYC? So I think that the mess right now, it's, it's interesting because many people think that you need this kind of stuff to go to mass adoption. But what is the mess? 70% uh, of the population of this planet right now don't have a complete KYC identity. They are either unbanked or underbanked and they cannot e easily access to PayPal or other stuff like that because of the regulation. So we talk about financial exclusion. But financial exclusion is not because the technology is not there. It's not because uh, evil companies, they don't want to serve customers. So of course, companies, they want to serve customers. The problem is that they can't because the level of the, regulator, the regulation that the nation states implement in order to control uh, the rich people in the so-called Western world, uh, this, the same rules, they basically, they are too strict in order to allow anybody else to enter this game. So I would say that the strict majority Majority of people on this planet, they cannot enter uh, normally defined KYC requirement. So most of the people, most of the mass adoption of physical cash will be uh, basically trapped out of the instrument they have now. And second, the internet is, is becoming every year since uh, since 30 years more and more important. And uh, I mean, I don't see. 2040 business being able to survive just serving the local neighborhood. They will have to stay on the internet. And cash, physical cash, paper cash, doesn't work on the internet. Uh, you need a digital solution for the internet. So you, you need digital cash, and that is Bitcoin. So uh, mass adoption will be reached because uh, mass adoption is outside the KYC, not, not adopting the KYC. Okay, so... Um... We we'll figure out the, the thing about the banks, about the other competing coins or shit coins or altcoins. Will there be in the end uh, like one coin to rule them all, or there will be uh, like multiple options? I'm I'm as as many know. I'm super convinced. I mean, I think that Bitcoin has uh, relevant chances to fail, but I don't think that the multi-coin scenario has any chance to to succeed at all. Of course, the future is unpredictable, so we don't know anything is possible. But then we have to wait the possibility with some level of probability, some level of realism, and I think it's completely unrealistic for to have a competition. Uh, the first reason is that uh, the uh, the only way that a digital digital protocol an open source digital protocol can work is uh, if it's not destroyed by infinite inflation. So Bitcoin as we say is a software. You can take the software and copy it and creating another clone and another clone and another clone. Everybody has a strong incentive to create an, yet another and another and another clone. So if there was no any, uh, it, if there wasn't any force keeping this, this, this incentive in, in, in place, basically you would have infinite inflation because we have 21 million bitcoins, but we don't have 21 million crypto. We have actually infinite uh, indet uh, an indeterminate number of cryptos which can diverge to infinity. So the problem is that you can create as many shitcoins you want, but if the market distributes, uh, uh, let's say, imagine a market which, distribute, uh, which distributes uh, uh, evenly across all the shitcoins, 
then the value of, of each is zero. Of course, this is an, is an extremization, but any kind of distribution is highly unstable because with Bitcoin, uh, if we want to, pro to do economical planning for ourselves and our family and our business for the future, we have two, uh, two um, uh, things to, well, we have one thing to consider, which is uh, Bitcoin demand. When we know the demand, we, uh, we already know the supply and we can get to the price. But with uh, crypto, uh, the, we have two incognitas. One is the demand and one is the supply that can change every day. So if the market was uh, distributing heavy, evenly across any shit coin, the market will basically be a market of absolute inflation without any kind of hardness to this money. And I think that uh, a money which is not hard would fail to compete uh, to existent uh, regulated solution. So the, the second question is, assuming that a multi-coin multi future is not possible, how can the market decide one winner which is hard, uh, which, which is uh, hard to produce, uh, which determines a schedule? Uh, and then network effects come, uh, uh, come at rescue because uh, basically you cannot replicate the typical um, features of Bitcoin because uh, some of those are like historical, like Bitcoin is the first. Uh, in, in game theory, you have some, some, uh, something which is called the focal point. So if we have to, to meet in a city, if we have to meet in Riga, but you don't tell me where, and there are 100 people meeting in Riga, but you don't know where, they will go to, the to what is si more similar to the center, because that's a shelling point. Bitcoin is the shelling point. Uh, it's the first, it's the biggest, and uh, if, it goes, uh, if it gets overthrown by another, then the other one will likely be overthrown by another and another and another. So if you lose the shelling point, uh, you will never recover it or you will not recover it until something completely unexpected happens that we cannot even predict. So uh, the idea that you can have multiple competing currency uh, outside the state intervention uh, is also historically false. Uh, the, the human civilization converge over two uh, two basically um, uh, kinds of money, which were gold and silver, and they basically absorbed the wealth, uh, the, the wealth from any other competing money because gold was the hardest form of money. Silver was surviving for a reason. Gold was not divisible enough. So if you, have to, if you want to buy a coffee, you cannot give them powder of gold because it's difficult to verify. So silver was needed to supply the fact that, become, that gold was not divisible. But Bitcoin is fairly divisible. So we don't need any silver to Bitcoin gold. I mean, the silver to Bitcoin gold is uh, Satoshis. So they are just a subfraction of Bitcoin. So I'm, of course, nobody knows the future, but I think that uh, technologically speaking, economically speaking, uh, using any kind of heuristic we can apply, uh, a multi-coin future is highly alike, uh, unlikely. Uh, indeed, one of the reasons we have multiple fiat money today is not because of free market, but it's because of nation states uh, imposing legal, legal tender in their states. If you, if you think about the black market, which is the real free market in the Soviet Union, in Cuba, in Venezuela, when people is free uh, to, to choose the money they want because they're operating outside the government impositions, then they always converge to the US dollars. And even central banks, they are basically all using as a reserve asset the US dollars. And even international payments, somehow they get through the USA, uh, even in, in, from countries that are enemies of the USA. So there is a winner takes, takes it all effect in money. And we have seen that with the gold, which was a good form of money, but unfortunately not very, uh, not very, not ready for the digital age. And then we see that now with the shitcoin US dollar, which is basically taking over everything, uh, except that governments, they try to impose with the use of violence their own local shitcoins. But if you look at the black markets, people use US dollars. Bitcoin actually survived multiple attacks. Like during the past years, there was like miners, uh, some like governments. So do you believe it's a strong system? It is. It is becoming uh, both uh, robust at the base layer, uh, so it's very difficult to, to, to change, to shock, and anti-fragile at the, at the upper layer where you can, uh, for example, the difference is that something which is robust 
you cannot kill it. Something which is anti-fragile, you can kill it, but they will just replicate and, and come and come again. So, for, ex for example, the exchange level, is more, the exchange layer is more anti-fragile. You can, you can try to regulate them, they close down and another will come. And, or the black market on the internet. You can shut down the Silk Road and other tree will take its place and so on and so on. Well, the base layer, which is not anti-fragile because if you destroy the, for example, the, uh, the economical the, um, uh, issuance schedule of Bitcoin, is not that another will take its place. Probably we, we, are, we are over for good. So the base layer of Bitcoin is not anti-fragile. It is robust and it's difficult to change, it's difficult to stop, it's difficult to influence. We have seen miners trying to claim that they control Bitcoin and they failed. We have seen uh, uh, companies, especially US-centric companies like uh, digital, um, uh, well, a lot of companies, uh, leaders in the sector trying to change Bitcoin as they pleased and failing at doing that. We'll probably see other kind of attacks, for example, so far, developers, Bitcoin developers, were always allied to Bitcoin. I mean, the good developers were defending Bitcoin and the evil miners were attacking. But some days, I don't rule out the possibility that maybe in 10 years, 20 years, we will see a conflict of interest between developers and Bitcoin. For example, what I mentioned before about ossification. Uh, I mean, I, I love Bitcoin developers. They are our, greater, our greatest asset. But there could be a situation in which they want to do stuff and the network doesn't want to do this stuff. So eventually, uh, even controlled by developers will, will uh, also, I mean, uh, the 2x attack, the New York uh, agreement attack, it was uh, made also by former Bitcoin developers like Jeff Garzik and, and, uh, and uh, Gavin Anderson. So uh, there are a lot of social attacks, like now there is the fake Toshi attack of Craig Wright uh, creating this religious cult. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, of course, only mentally, mentally impaired people can fall for that, but there is a lot of them in the world. So uh, there, are effect there could be effective attacks as well. And uh, I mean, uh, this, is, this shirt is from the great conference um, uh, Breaking Bitcoin in Amsterdam. And uh, uh, I think that we could witness, I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating right now, we're not yet there, but there could be some kind of uh, uh, what we could call the politically correctness attack. If you think about that, we, uh, many technological projects suffer something of like that. So there is this culture of uh, victimization and uh, uh, like um, uh, politically correctness, what you call could call the social justice uh, warrior culture, especially in the US, especially in Silicon Valley. And uh, it is actually attacking many projects. For example, uh, you can see that in Linux, uh, the, the founder of Linux, he had to, uh, to basically to step down, not because uh, he was not good at coding or not good at maintaining Linux, but because it, it wasn't good at answering in a nice way to people proposing stupid ideas. So uh, people were proposing stupid idea and he was answering this is a stupid idea and that was considered toxic and not nice. And so there was a, a very strong uh, social uh, pressure to change the, what is important from technical, uh, technical viability of an idea, so technical merits, to uh, being nice, especially being nice to protected categories. So uh, right now in Linux, if you are, uh, that's also paradoxical because the typical cypherpunk culture was also about living away our, uh, our real life identities and to be more equal over the internet where uh, your sex, gender, race, uh, basically nothing uh, of what you are in the real life is relevant. Like you are on GitHub, you propose a modification uh, which is nice, which is uh, effective, which is safe, then it gets adopted. You, pr you, are, uh, you are like uh, the, 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 the most uh, uh, victim, uh, victimized person on earth, you propose something that which doesn't work, it gets rejected because it's not about your feelings, it's about code that works. And this is the culture that started Bitcoin, basically. Most of the people in the cypherpunk mailing list, some of them were anonymous. Satoshi Nakamoto were anonymous. We don't know if Satoshi was male, female, one, seven, uh, tall, short, uh, black, white, or whatever, or gay, or straight. We don't know, we don't care. Uh, it's not relevant at all. So right now I can see this kind of attempt to switch from uh, uh, the, the hard truth of, uh, uh, of uh, I mean, uh, software excellence to the convenient uh, uh, lie of uh, 
being nice with uh, poor victims and uh, like um, basically it's a political attack. It's uh, politics infiltrating software development. It happened to the gaming industry as well, like the, the famous Gamergate. So gamers were mostly male people and mostly teenagers and mostly assholes and they were insulting people, uh, especially girls. And so basically there was this incredible uh, social movement coming from the US of criminalizing any, any, any gamer and changing, I mean, many software developers have been fired, not because they were not good at software development, but because they, the political uh, ideology didn't align with the prevalent uh, uh, mantra right now, especially in Silicon Valley. Bitcoin is, uh, Bitcoin is fun because it's uh, something that uh, I think will show them that is different even in this regard. Like uh, they, uh, they try to police, to talk police Linux and they succeeded. They tried to talk police the gaming industry and they succeeded. They tried to, well, they, they did that in, to some degree too with the Tor project and even if that's more complex, uh, they will try to do that with Bitcoin and I think they will fail and that will be another success, another example of anti-fragility. So you've mentioned that, uh, as we agreed, that uh, the Bitcoin system is strong itself. Um, so the the threats that are outside are not so so important, maybe, or not so dangerous. So is this thing that we've discussed previously about the, the community having the conflict between itself uh, can somehow ruin the system? Because you know, as they say, any strong system can be defeated from within of the system. Yeah, the point is that Bitcoin is not a community. Uh, gold or Bitcoin money is, is a, a tool that uh, you need in order to go beyond your community and to, uh, I mean, you use money to interact with people you don't know or even you don't like. Uh, there is money flowing between uh, uh, enemy uh, nation states, between, uh, uh, between uh, ISIS and, and the US government, between uh, the Soviet Union and, and the US government again. So, Money is neutral and it goes beyond the political division. That means that uh, if you want to destroy Bitcoin from within, there is no within, basically. Bitcoin is, uh, is not a community. There is, a, there is some, something you could define a community of people working on Bitcoin mostly. There are still developers, which there, is there quite is an important yeah. part. There is a developer community, which is, a, is not a group, is not a hierarchy, so it's a very, uh, a very loose uh, community with new people coming in, some anonymous people. But there is some kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of uh, very loose uh, uh, group dynamics go going there. And uh, there could be an attack coming from inside, but it already, already happened. Like, uh, if you think about that, the so-called big block attack, which was basically so, uh, for many people, at attacks, maybe they get sponsored or pushed or helped from the outside by enemies of Bitcoin. But mostly that's not the case. Mostly an attack is just somebody which has an idea about Bitcoin. Bitcoin proves them wrong and they cannot accept their idea to be wrong. And so they want to change Bitcoin to be uh, more in their own image. So, for example, there were people that were approaching Bitcoin in 2012, 13, not as hard and dark money, but as a cheap, cool system of payment alternative to PayPal. And, but, just, uh, but just cooler because of some technological reasons. These people, uh, they, 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 at the beginning, Bitcoin uh, was apparently uh, confirming their view because it was uh, apparently very cheap. The reason was that the payment for the security was done uh, by hodlers to inflation and not by transactors to, to transaction fees. And the reason was that nobody was using Bitcoin anyway. So there were many reasons why apparently it was like a cheap uh, payment system. Uh, also, there was not a very solid uh, uh, economical knowledge among Bitcoiners back then. But the same, then some developers, they started uh, some community members. So developers or marketeers like uh, Gavin Andreessen was a developer, Roger Ver was a marketeer. Uh, but still, both they were, they, 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 they have been disappointed by the Bitcoin reality, which was not conforming to their view about Bitcoin. And they tried to attack it, to change it. Uh, in their view, to to maintain it as it, as it was, but actually to change it to be similar to what they wanted. And the same, is, same goes with, uh, uh, with the toxicity uh, the debate. 
uh, you live in the Silicon Valley, you think that uh, all the software development out there is just a social dynamic of uh, uh, big corporation paying developers and setting political agendas. So you think that Bitcoin uh, will fit this narrative of uh, cool Silicon Valley developers and, uh, and then you are disappointed and then you will attack it and when you cannot succeed, you will leave it. Same things happen actually for uh, Ethereum. Maybe you are a very good web developer, you are great with JavaScript, you can do a lot of UX, but you are not good at security, you are not good at cryptography primitives, you are not good as, uh, at economical theory. So you want to just to play with uh, some JavaScript-like program and you want Bitcoin to fit the narrative. Then Bitcoin will actually d disappoint you because it cannot be changed to become some cheap JavaScript playground and so you will leave to create your own uh, Ethereum or whatever. Uh, uh, people who wanted uh, uh, the, the, the JavaScript playground, they got Ethereum. People who wanted the, the, the fast uh, PayPal, the open source PayPal, they got uh, Bcash or whatever. Uh, people who want uh, the, like the politically, uh, politically um, uh, the, the political police deciding Bitcoin development, they will create a Bitcoin nice fork where everybody is nice and the more nice you have, the more rushing power you have or something like that. But I think that uh, uh, we already suffered attacks from within. Sometimes these attacks from, from within are maybe possibly flu f fueled by external entities. I mean, when, uh, when Bitmain attacked Bitcoin, they were leveraging this narrative about uh, fast, cheap payments. But I cannot imagine. I can imagine that the idea that the Chinese government was also somehow involved with one of these main companies in China is not completely impossible. It's not something to rule out immediately. I mean, it could be a conspiracy theory, but it sounds a realistic one. So sometimes there will be some kind of collusion between external entities and internal. Uh, what again, Max Kaiser called the Bitcoin derangement syndrome. When you stay in Bitcoin too long, uh, you will, uh, you have a very high probability to become mad because Bitcoin doesn't confirm to your views. It exists, it goes, and maybe it will happen to me as well. I mean, someday Bitcoin will uh, will prove me wrong, and I will not accept it, and I will create a shitcoin. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, the previous attacks was uh, mostly based on the tech differences, like small blocks, big blocks, and now we're seeing like more. Um, political or like groups or like people are offended by some things like by your short and something like that right. maximalists and uh, and all other nice people so there's a difference between now and then yeah it's a different kind of attack also uh, just as the discussion about scalability can be reduced to a, to a very ideological position but actually it's correct that uh, I mean, it's not wrong that people think about maximizing on-chain scale as much as is possible in a safe way. So Adam Beck was proposing uh, block size increases since years, and many other developers, I mean, some developers like Luke Dashir is, is proposing a block, block size decrease for security. Uh, some other people is propos uh, are proposing uh, since years block, uh, block size increases. So uh, the point is not about that. And the same goes with the, this recent uh, toxi uh, to toxicity discussion. Some people are really concerned about uh, uh, somebody not being nice, which is a good concern. I mean, if we can be nice, let's be nice. But the problem is that uh, uh, every kind of debate can be used as a tool to try to control some situation in Bitcoin or uh, outside Bitcoin, like in the uh, Gamergate situation. So it's new, but it's the same dynamic. If you think about that, uh, the point was not really about big blocks. Even when there was the New York agreement, uh, when uh, Jeff Garzik was talking about uh, the BTC1 implementation, the point was never really about blocks. It was mostly about firing Bitcoin core. Like uh, mo most of the rhetoric by Roger Ver and others was, these developers, they failed, so we had to fire them and to take control and one of the first actions that uh, Garzik and his developers did in BTC1 implementation, the broken implementation that would have killed the network if adopted immediately because it was uh, bugged, uh, the, one of the first things they did was to remove the, uh, the web of trust of, uh, uh, of bootstrapping nodes uh, by famous Bitcoin developers to replace it with companies joining the New York, the New York agreement. So 
the words like basically block and uh, and uh, and so and so on. So they wanted to uh, to attempt a corporate takeover. And I mean, I was in New York back then. I was not in the private room discussion of the new New York no, agreement. No, I, I was not important enough. But I, I've seen, I've heard some rumors, and I've heard some not rumors, but some actual discussion. And the the sentence sentences like taking over uh, or firing Bitcoin Core and uh, replace the governance was not uh, was explicitly uh, said by people there. So this new uh, discussion about uh, only nice people can develop uh, on Bitcoin is different, but not so different because the the block size war was not really about block size. It was most about control. Don't you afraid that uh, the people who are saying that uh, nice people should do the code and all other stuff, uh, they will just move uh, in other like competing shit coins or something like that. But these people are actually quite smart. Yeah, that I mean, but uh, if I thought so, that's the paradox there. If I thought that different altcoins could succeed, then uh, it's a win if they move to other altcoins because they can succeed. So they move, and we will just use the altcoin which is better. If I think, as I think, that altcoins cannot succeed, then there is nowhere they can move. They can go to work for, for, for Apple Pay, maybe. They can go to work for Facebook Global Coin. But eventually, if the altcoin paradigm doesn't work, as I think it doesn't, uh, they, they, have not, they have nowhere to really move uh, long term. Of course, that could slow down development in Bitcoin. But the, an interesting thing is that uh, uh, it's not always necessarily forever a good thing to have uh, fast development. We need good developers. Uh, also, I don't, this may seem like a personal, this is probably a personal opinion. Also, I'm, I'm not a developer myself. I'm a theoretical physicist. I have a very high level understanding of tech, which is not enough to judge a competent developer. And I admit it. But my impression is that no single very, very highly qualified developers ever left Bitcoin because anybody was not nice with him. Uh, the first time it will happen, I will be concerned. So far, what I've seen is the opposite, is uh, developers being uh, basically uh, proposing ideas that were technically subpar, so uh, developer being technically uh, not skilled enough to make uh, their changes to Bitcoin pass the very harsh and very serious peer review, they usually transform the rejection of their idea into some kind of personal persecution toward their, uh, their I don't know, their, their, their personality or their whatever. So to, uh, people, I mean, the, the, the guy inventing the term maximalist was basically Vitalik Buterin, and uh, he proposed some changes to Bitcoin. Competent people told him, uh, this is, these are very bad ideas. So you shouldn't do that because of this and this and this reason. And instead of accepting that, he started to call them maximalists. And recently, people uh, complaining about toxicity are, well, the first one was actually Gavin Andreessen. When Gavin Andreessen was uh, uh, starting to feel some pushback to his idea, he was thinking back then to be the king of the Bitcoin, the new Satoshi. So he thought that he was in charge of governance. When he understood that he couldn't influence governance anymore because he was not anymore the more competent dev there, he was one of the first, but not one of the best. When he started to understand it, he started to blame toxicity. I mean, he said, uh, he, he made this proposal, p 2 Sage, and Luke Dashir had something that anybody now recognizes as a superior proposal, and he basically uh, stopped that proposal by claiming that Luke Dashir was a, a toxic person. So it was already a rhetoric uh, uh, back then. And, uh, but having losing, uh, having lose uh, uh, Gavin Anderson, I mean, it's is bad to lose any developer. But if you look at his track record uh, in the recent years, he didn't contribute much. So it's the other way around. It's not that uh, people who is very good at coding will be insulted because they are black or tall or short or white or women or and then it will leave and then they will bring away their skills is that people will, who don't don't have enough skill to make any contribu relevant contribution anymore they will feel uh, they will feel irrelevant and they will blame uh, the, the, the the scrutiny and the, the very harsh feedback on their proposals to some kind of personal toxicity and they will leave 
but they will leave after they already left any meaningful contribution like it happened with most of them. So the, that funny thing about um, your Twitter handle, uh, you recently changed that, but before that it was I identify myself as a tall black woman. Yeah. What was it about? Uh, it was a progression actually. So the first, uh, the first moment I, I used that kind of meme was when there was the discussion of uh, women in blockchain like uh, uh, this panel is not good because there are not enough women. Which, uh, I mean, I know that uh, it, it sounds bad if I talk about that because I happen to be a man. But actually, I have, some, uh, I, I have the luck to have some kind of uh, uh, underprivileged uh, characteristic. Like I'm Italian, and Italian were considered almost as black in the United States uh, a few decades ago. I'm short, and most of the people in Bitcoin is taller like you, privileged bastard. And uh, I'm not an English speaker, and actually that's a very serious thing. Like right now, I can interact with Bitcoiners. Uh, in 2013, my English skills were so bad that I was actually excluded by any meaningful discussion. Because uh, the reality is that uh, uh, network effects matter, and so the development and anything else is happening in English. So I had to adapt. I, I didn't start, uh, I know, you need uh, at least three Italian-speaking pe people on any panel, because otherwise I will feel excluded and offended because I don't speak a good English. I had to learn to speak this perfect Oxfordian English that you can hear now. So I had to adapt in order to enter there. So there was this, uh, this discussion that this specific panel in the conference were, didn't have enough women. And, uh, and I found the things crazy. And so I, um, I, I'm not the first doing that. There is this kind of contradiction between the pressure to have uh, uh, some kind of uh, distribution of, of, uh, of uh, visibility based on sexual attributes. Like, uh, I mean, uh, you, have, you, you need uh, uh, at least half uh, a part of the panel with, uh, with a penis and half without, or with a Y chromosome or without, which is, I think is completely irrelevant for the content of the discussion. And uh, on the other hand, you also have the culture of uh, uh, you know, self-identification. Uh, you have to call me with this pronoun because I decide the way people call me. So you are, you are aggressing me if you co don't call me with the, uh, their pronoun or, or whatever, this craziness, which is un completely, I mean, uh, uh, it's inside the bubble in some overprivileged uh, places, like really first world problems, like uh, uh, Silicon Valley or New York or other places like that you can find. People who actually have to work they don't have time to complain about the problems. Anyway, so I, uh, like many other people, I joined uh, these two paradoxical views, and I said, if everybody can identify themselves as, as they want, because this is the new normal, and I'm okay with that, I mean, I don't care. And if uh, you need half of the panel to be women, identify as a woman, uh, as a woman. Then um, people started to complain the, to the fact that I, but I, I was not actually a woman, so I'm a man, so I'm a privilege. Uh, so I started to, to talk about the height because I'm short and that's an underprivilege. So I identify as a tall uh, woman. Then people started to discuss about ethnicity, a race, which is literally not a problem. I mean, maybe there can be a, a, a very strong presence of uh, men culture in technology because most of the people there are men. But uh, uh, I never heard, maybe it happens somewhere in the world but I never heard about the racial problem in Bitcoin. Some of the best developers in Lightning Network, they come from, uh, from different ethnicity. Uh, there are a lot of Asian people. Race was literally not a problem for our generation, our culture, especially in tech. Nobody care about uh, uh, common ancestors and, and genetics in Bitcoin. So uh, people complaining about that triggered me to start to introduce the color. So I identified as a tall black woman uh, so in, in two cases, woman and black, it was underprivileged. And in the case of tall, I just increased my privilege, actually, because I'm short. And then I, ident I realized that nobody is self-identifying about numbers. So I can, be, I can identify as a woman, as a man, but what if I identify as more than one people? And so I started to identify as seven tall women, which is interesting because, for example, in a panel, in a conference panel of eight people, if I self-identify as seven people, I have the right to fill seven out of eight positions in the panel. So uh, if the panel is, is, is of six, seven, I can be the panel with myself. So it's a very smart self-identification. Uh, unfortunately, there was some problem because uh, people understood, misunderstood seven tall black women as seven feet tall 
black woman. So uh, I, I didn't identify as a seven feet tall woman, which would be too much. I identified the seven different tall of unspe unspecified height black women. So we are now getting to this Bitcoin maximalist stuff. Can you explain this? Well, I tried actually uh, in Baltic on a Badger 2000, uh, 2018, I did a speech called uh, Maximal Bitcoin Maximalism Dissected, which was an attempt to actually explain where this term comes from. As I said, it comes from uh, mostly one guy, Vitalik Buterin, trying to, uh, to insult, in a way, uh, people that think that money has a very strong network effect and that uh, altcoin, uh, that the multi-coin scenario is a scenario of an undetermined supply, so it cannot work. So the things that we said before about uh, the, uh, the multi-coin scenario being unrealistic, uh, Vitaly Buterin st started to label this as maximalism in a pejorative sense. So many people, they said, no, we are not maximalists and I'll explain you why, and other people just decided to embrace the slur. You know, uh, many people, when they get insulted, they can decide either to reject the insult or to embrace it in an ironical, sarcastic way, and to say, yes, we are, and now we call maximalism this common sense that we are just trying to explain to you. So I am in the second category. Some people are still rejecting the term. I decided to embrace it ironically. And I tried to explain a little bit was what, what is it about in this semi-serious uh, tongue-in-cheek uh, tongue uh, exposition in Riga. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Baltic on Badger had a lot of great speakers, so I couldn't monopolize two hours on stage. So I didn't finish my presentation, but I did finish it actually later in uh, Ulster in Switzerland during a meetup, so there should be my, a video around of my explanation of uh, uh, Bitcoin maximalism dissected. Next year, uh, if, they if the organizers of Baltic on a Badger will accept it, I will propose something different, which is a, a, sh a shitcoin, um, a shitcoin apologism um, uh, still mend, which means that I will try to make the point uh, I mean, there are some points that go against Bitcoin maximalism. Uh, I'm disappointed that nobody around, nobody in the shitcoiner camp even uh, really discovered this point. So I will be my own uh, contradictory and I will try to challenge myself, still manning some kind of shitcoiner uh, talking points. Let's see how it goes. Can we describe Bitcoin maximalism as a person who sticks with Bitcoin and like 100% Bitcoin only and uh, that's it, no, no other options? Uh, well, I, I would not say that because, for example, um, uh, I don't think that, for example, a Bitcoin maximalist who is convinced that Bitcoin will succeed maybe and the altcoins will, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will fail for sure. I don't think that this uh, uh, would, uh, for example, prevent them from trading. Uh, if you have a very good perception of the market and you feel that the market is going to do something stupid and you are a good uh, uh, reader of the market, you can basically speculate on them. So, for example, I mean, government bonds, long-term government bonds are uh, trash. There is no economical theory that can, so, that can sustain the level of debt of the United States in the long run. That's just economically absurd. That said, for 40 or 50 years, you can make money out of, uh, uh, you can make money just uh, uh, lending money to the government and getting some interest. So eventually it will fail, but in the short term it is, is not necessarily true. So if you are smart enough in the short term, you can actually uh, ride uh, the bubble of delusion. Let, let's talk about, uh, uh, you are a technologist in the 90s and you see the, bo the, the dot com bubble coming. So you understand the internet. You understand that the internet will be great, but you understand that 99% of dot-com uh, craziness is just noise and snake oil and uh, irrational FOMO, and you know that it's going to crash badly. But still, you are so smart that you get the actual timing, and so you invest in pet.com and you sell, uh, and, and then you, you go away with money. Uh, is that not being an internet maximalist? No, you can understand the dynamic and you can still uh, entertain I mean, I know many shitcoin traders that are Bitcoin maximalists, but they are shitcoin traders because they just know that shitcoins right now are following these waves of irrationality. They are good at navigating irrationality, and they just do it. 
which in my opinion is not a bad thing, uh, even ethically speaking, because the speculator is somebody that uh, uh, is always telling the truth, if you think about it. So I think that this asset will go up. I don't think there is a reason for that. I think it's a stupid thing. But it will go up because around me, people is, uh, the, is just uh, in full delusion mode. So I think it will go up. I buy. I put my money where my mouth is. I put my skin in the game. And I signal the, uh, well, basically, I signal the, the market that the price is undervalued. When it reaches what I think it could be the top, I sell. So basically, I'm telling people, I think this will go down. So I'm completely honest about that. So shitcoin marketers and shitcoin promoters, they are lying to people because they are saying to people things that are not true. Like they have to say, this is the new Bitcoin, uh, this is faster, this is safer, this is quantum, blah, blah, blah. They have to make up a uh, uh, buzzword and they have to lie. Actually, they have to, uh, to leverage uh, confusion and, uh, and uh, a misconception in order to sell their product. This is, in my opinion, unethical because you are lying to people uh, to sell your stuff. But the trader is not lying. He is saying, I think that people will buy this stuff, so they buy. I think that people will sell this stuff, so they sell. And in selling, they help the market correcting the price. So speculators, in my opinion, are, are OK. Also, uh, Bitcoin maximalism may, uh, I don't think, for example, uh, if I identify as a maximalist, I don't think that uh, I will never use uh, uh, fiat money or stuff like that. Uh, it would be a nice political message to be Bitcoin only. Many of my friends are Bitcoin only. It's respectable, but I don't think it's, it's always reasonable. Uh, if the government let me do something with fiat money, I will use fiat money first because I will get rid of fiat money first and then I will use Bitcoin. So I assume, let's assume you are in Venezuela and you have one US dollar that you got in the black market and you have one Bolivar and you have to spend something to, to, to buy food. And you know that the Bolivar is going to be the, to be the base by 30% or whatever. Of course, you keep, uh, you, 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 you keep in your, basically you tesorize your US dollar and you spend your shitcoin. Same goes with fiat. I think that many Bitcoin maximalists, they will rather spend fiat if they can and only then spend Bitcoin. I do that. I mean, when I have fiat, I try to spend fiat first. So uh, it's not not touching other stuff. It's, not, it's just being honest with yourself about long-term sustainability. Do you think that fiat is sustainable long-term? Uh, if you really understand what's going on, you know that it's just, it's just logically unsustainable. Is Bitcoin sustainable long-term? We don't know, but maybe. Are infinite altcoins sustainable long-term? Not at all. Uh, that's just impossible. So you, uh, you just uh, confirm to the, some kind of reasonable prediction in your behavior, which sometimes means that, uh, I mean, uh, when, uh, when Jian Wu and Roger Wei were, were so, and Craig Wright were so kind to donate me some Bcash, I, I sold this Bcash on, uh, at market price and I got more Bitcoins. Uh, so I touched shitcoins in a sense. So you're Bitcoin only. How do you like live? on a regular basis like you know they a day of bitcoin only person I, uh, you still need to exchange to fiat you know because it's so there was a phase in which uh, most of the so i'm not bitcoin only because uh, part since uh, my job is to teach to mostly fiat people and to consult fiat people i receive some fiat more than i would want actually i, I always i i'm always make a big discount if you pay me in bitcoin but most people still pay me in fiat so i get a lot of fiat and so I spend fiat and, and, and uh, well, actually I don't store Bitcoin. I lost all my Bitcoins in a tragic botting accident. So I have no Bitcoin, but I have some friends uh, that are Bitcoin only. A uh, few years ago, uh, they actually were using big time these credit card systems like Sapo. So they were basically keep storing everything in Bitcoin on a third party though. So a little bit of their Bitcoin were on a third party and they were using these credit cards in order to spend. Uh, this was easy because any place accepting, uh, accepting a credit card was possible to, to spend. People who, I mean, since that was not possible anymore after Wavecrest, uh, Mass, right now people will leave Bitcoin only that I know. They usually every month exchange for cash. So they get some uh, physical cash and they can spend it. It's, uh, I mean, it, it can be a, a, a new friction because you have to find a guy to sell. But usually, you know, when you do that every month, you also establish a network of buyers. So you have your OTC, uh, your little OTC desk, let's say, and you can have a, a very uh, reliable flow of uh, 
uh, Bitcoin out and shitcoin in so you can spend them. In your opinion, Bitcoin super villain and Bitcoin superhero? Hmm. I think these these two um, roles will change uh, during the during the the ages. Uh, right now, uh, I would say that the Bitcoin, the typical Bitcoin superhero, is still a developer. I don't think that would be the case in 20 years from now because Bitcoin is software, but it's also money, and now it's all about software development. But eventually, it will not be. Uh, so right now, the typical Bitcoin superhero is some software developer like Gregory Maxwell or. Or uh, or SIPA, Peter Wheel, in my view, like they are the the, the guys working for free since uh, years in order to make this stuff work. Uh, of course, if you exclude Satoshi Nakamoto himself, which is which is the the, 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 the by definition the super the superhero, the super villain. Uh, it's it's trickier because we have a lot of them, so it's very difficult to choose. They are different. There are different modes. Top three, top three. So right now, as we do this interview. I would say that Bitcoin supervillain uh, may be um, the, um, the chair of the um, Federal Reserve because we can have a lot of infights, but we have to remember that the, the role of Bitcoin is actually to, uh, bec- to make uh, central banking irrelevant. So uh, let's say a couple, the, um, the, uh, the, the chair of the Federal Reserve and the IRS in America, they are the, they are the two things that Bitcoin is going to challenge. And even they are, if they are not reacting to, to Bitcoin so much right now, they are still the supervillain. They are supervillain that, if, that they don't even know that the superhero is coming from the, for them. So they are quiet right now. But they are the final boss anyway. And then there are the more contingent supervillain, super which are, uh, well, at this point, uh, is still a supervillain, but is going to become some uh, funny entertainment uh, uh, like comic relief, it's Craig Wright. Like Craig Wright is a uh, is of course a, a con artist, uh, and he, he started to pretend to be Satoshi Nakamoto. And uh, and the point is that his claims are becoming so more and more and more absurd that now the uh, you know uh, the at, at the beginning you could think that that was very damaging. Like there is a this strange there is this strange situation in which the more uh, absurd your scam is the less damaging you are. Because if your scam is very subtle, you can actually scam smart people, and so you can destroy reputations, uh, careers, uh, money, time. Uh, you can push for wrong technical decisions. So, uh, so scams which are almost serious are usually more dangerous. Well, while when you go to the Carlos Matos level, so, 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 that's, I mean, somebody will lose money because of you, but that those people, unfortunately, is beyond help. I mean, you cannot help somebody who is investing in uh, Bitcoin because of Carlos Matos. If, I mean, it's beyond help, unfortunately. So Craig Wright started here because there were actual people like, like Gavin Andreessen, the, which reputation has been destroyed by supporting that fraud. And now, yeah, bamboozled. And now uh, Craig Wright is moving to the Carlos Matos level in which actually, I mean, it's more funny than anything else. If not, for the fact that they are, uh, is actually ma- uh, aggressing using the, um, using the law, people with, uh, with this kind of uh, uh, trials, uh, he- he's suing people uh, with the banking is fraud. Uh, the most famous case is Odell Nout, and there is Peter McCormack. So uh, is, uh, these people, I mean, uh, it's, all, it's all good and fun, but these people are losing money because of this, uh, these trials. I mean, the state power is not, is not something to be, uh, to be taken uh, lightly. Uh, w- when you are in a, in, a, in a court, bad things can happen to you or to your wealth or to your family. So uh, I, uh, Craig Wright is still dangerous for Bitcoin because uh, he is suing people. Uh, eventually, uh, it will start to, I mean, uh, even if cards can be, even if judges can be stupid or corrupt, they cannot be so stupid or so corrupt to uh, to to, uh, to basically um, for for Kev, for Craig Wright to, to to win, and then so uh, the the third the third uh, super villain I think it's a, a way nicer person, but it's in my opinion more dangerous. And it's uh, the Vitalik Buterin uh, still the Vitalik Buterin uh, type. So the guy which is very smart is uh, not an obvious fraud like Craig Wright. 
is a uh, really uh, he, he's a really smart guy. He's not a developer. He's more like a journalist, but he's very good at words. He's very good at logic, and uh, he creates basically a, a lot of confusion and a lot of distraction. And he can distract uh, generation and generation of developers or investors uh, into a dead end because uh, it is his dead end that he can control. He can manipulate. He can shape as a narrative. So that's a that's a villain because. Uh, even if uh, it's not so aggressive uh, as the others, the effect is a lot of people losing money and time and reputation into, into something that doesn't make any sense. Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? Uh, everybody except Craig Wright. Um, I don't know. I, I, uh, what interest- but you have your opinion, you have your view on that. I do. The interesting thing that you can see is that the more the opinion becomes uh, uh, relevant and, and or realistic, the less people will start. We, we go on talking about that because the, the point about Satoshi Nakamoto anonymity or pseudonymity is a very very high stake point. Uh, if these uh, persons or person are still alive, then they risk everything, and the, the operation Bitcoin itself uh, is subject to some risk. You think about the WikiLeaks operation. Even if uh, Julian Assange is uh, innocent of the accusation he received about uh, rape or whatever, all these accusations have been dropped, but still the character assassination on the funder was used in order to damage the project itself. And that happened to other projects. So the guy, the, 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 the human being is fragile, especially as a narrative, as a political narrative. So uh, framing Satoshi Nakamoto doesn't just mean maybe arresting or torturing some guy in the, in the, in the dangers of the NSA. But it also means the possibility of character assassination, uh, which will, uh, which co- can be used as a as a weapon against the project itself. So it's super important for ma- for many many reasons that Satoshi Nakamoto maintains the the very good obsec that uh, he showed at the beginning. So uh, when when you don't know, you can just uh, you can just uh, fire hypotheses. But when you start to understand that something is kind of realistic, you stop. And that's something I've seen um, with many people when they were starting to get some information, uh, reliable information, they just stop ch- searching. That's a good thing. It's like a super serving instinct. I think it's, I mean, my personal opinion is that it's more likely a team. Uh, and uh, and uh, and basically that's all I, I'm willing to say publicly. <laughs> if you had an option to know like 100%, to, to know who, who he is or who they are so, or she, uh, the politically correct answer is I will not use it because I don't care because Bitcoin doesn't care. The honest answer is that I will totally, I mean, I'm super curious. And so if I had the option to know it without damaging Bitcoin, yeah. I would probably choose to know and then I will keep it as a, my best uh, uh, kept secret forever. But uh, I mean, uh, I don't it believe... Hard, isn't it hard to live with that type of secret, you know? Probably, probably, but the point is that nobody knows that I know, so maybe not so much. But uh, I mean, I, I don't believe people that are facing the option, they will really choose that two buttons, like no or not no, they will really press no, no. I mean, I know that that's what I'm supposed to say in an interview. So, okay, I will uh, not know. If you can say whatever you want. It's not, I don't believe people will really, uh, if they do that, if they can do that privately without consequences, Everybody is curious about. I mean, this is possibly one of the greatest achievement in in uh, finance and technology and, and and political struggle since uh, maybe the printing press or even or even more than that. So of course, I it it, it would be. I mean, uh, there is no other guy in history I'm more curious about than Satoshi Nakamoto. That said, if uh, knowing that could put uh, everything in danger. I will pers- I will stay with my curiosity because uh, uh, because it's uh, the the stakes are too high. Okay. So the final one. Uh, can you make a prediction of Bitcoin price by the end of this year? Absolutely. I would say between zero and three million dollars. <laughs> no, like very good bigger company. or smaller <laughs> than now. Uh, uh, so like, can you choose the date? Uh, choose the currency, like dollar or euro. And uh, make a prediction, like for example, on 10th of December 2018, or at the date of Baltic Honey Badger, or whatever, it will be bigger than 10,000 or smaller than 9,000. 
Yeah, so this doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have any scientific base, and the past uh, past performance doesn't well, guarantee course. anything. But what I've seen is basically a very rogue um, a series of bubbles that tend to be one order of magnitude bigger than the, than the previous one. So you have the $30 bubbles, then you have the uh, $260 bubble, then the $1,200, then the $99,000. Uh, so I expect the next uh, all-time high to be around the 100-200K uh, uh, bubble and then to collapse to some level close to the previous uh, all-time high if the dynamic remains the same, it could, it could change for many reasons. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the level of the next bubble should be, let's say, $200,000. Uh, $200, uh, uh, the problem is when? Uh, the beer market that we just passed was one of the longest, like the second longest in the history of Bitcoin. So I don't see any reason to have it uh, way longer than this. So uh, I could expect uh, usually Baltic on a badger... Like realistically. Let's because say. we will put your prediction on, on the prediction platform and someone will bet you. So let's say Baltic on a badger, uh, it will be uh, higher than the last Ultima. So let's say... 50k and uh, beyond the end of the year it could uh, reach the new FOMO all-time high like uh, let's say 200k and then collapse again uh, around maybe 10,000 or or two, or two, or, uh, or 20,000 so by the date of Baltic honey badger the price of bitcoin 50K. will be bigger than 50k yeah let's do bigger this. than 50k <laughs> let's probably, do it so 14 wrong. september bigger than 50k yeah. Let's try. Let's try. Okay. I, actually, I hope not. I, I mean, my, my hope is that that's not the case. So uh, many people uh, think, uh, say this. Uh, they, they usually uh, make these predictions because that they hope. It's wishful thinking. Let's hope that. But my hope is that it stays lower because I want to buy and uh, I have no no intention to spend right now. So I want to accumulate. So if Bitcoin goes to that level in five years, that's way better for me. It's more sustainable, less dangerous for political uh, reactions. So I hope that I'm wrong, but uh, I, I'm afraid that I could be right. Okay, so we will make that prediction for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, the version, the Raptor's Yeah.